Hello, my fellow humans. Welcome back to another episode of the Solar Punk Farmer, where we are out here growing a better future. I apologize for the bit of a hiatus. I have had a lot going on in both my professional and personal lives. I recently completed a permaculture design course and earned my Master Gardener certification, and have been busy studying and practicing different methods and philosophies of regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture seeks to heal the soil using the power of life itself. Being that life exists all around us, it's no surprise that partnering with it is a more inexpensive and eco-friendly way to run a garden, as opposed to relying on inputs that you get from your local retailer or online. Whether we're talking about expensive garden soils and amendments, or overpriced organic fertilizers and supplements. I mean, seriously, you're paying the same price for a bottle of pureed fish guts as you would for several months of RuneScape membership. And trust me, you would rather train your farming level on RuneScape as opposed to IRL if you smelled this stuff. Oh. <laughs> also, don't eat even get me started on spraying pesticides. Why would we be spraying insect killing poisons on our crops when global insect populations are already declining at a rate of 2.5% per year? Contributing to a mass extinction event is certainly not solar punk. But Mr. Solar Punk Farmer, can you really do that? Can you actually ditch the store-bought pesticides, fertilizers, and soil amendments? Or at the very least, reduce their use down to a negligible level? Well, my imaginary commentator friends, here in the Resilience Garden, I've been able to almost completely eliminate the use of all external sources of fertility. That fish hydrolysate you see there is for composting, which I only apply maybe a couple times a year. On top of that, I have never sprayed a single drop of pesticides in this garden, and in most of my garden, I haven't used any store-bought soil amendments at all. I have been able to get to where I am thanks in part to these five tips I'm about to share with you in this video. Please keep in mind that these methods work best when you're growing directly in the ground, or alternatively, in raised beds that contain a decent proportion of native soil. However, that being said, the last tip is dedicated to all of you space limited and container gardeners out there. And with that, let me lay some XP on you. Tip number one, utilize biomass present in your environment. Have you been plagued with crop residues from last season? Are there tons of dead tree branches just lying around? Do you have an overabundance of yard trimmings that just get tossed in the green bin every single week? Or worst of all, are your landfills filled to the brim with food waste? Well, I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear that all of the above are free sources of fertility that you can use for your garden. Sheet composting is a fantastic way to utilize dead plant material and other compostables that I covered in a previous video. If you want to check that out, the link is in the description. These yard trimmings, which I salvage from the yard waste bin every single week, make a fantastic mulch to cover your soil, as do these homemade wood chips that I produce from dead tree branches that I find lying around. Of course, food waste counts too. Pretty much any food scrap can be utilized provided you have the right method with which to compost it. If you want to break down tougher things such as meat or the corn industry's latest attempt to expand the definition of the word food, don't be afraid to enlist creepy crawlies or funky smelling microbes for help. When organic material decomposes, it eventually becomes humus. Humus is a biochemical nutrient reservoir and is the basic building block of the living fraction of soil. In this way, whatever nutrients are within these organic residues can be returned to the soil and made available to plants and all the other life forms that inhabit it. And again, we're talking about free and abundant resources here. Resources that you could actually run a garden alone off of. It's called lasagna gardening. It's very similar to sheet composting. Check it out. Tip number two, grow green manure with cover crops and biomass plants. It ultimately takes living plants to bring a soil to a fecund and productive state. Plants sequester carbon and essential nutrients, such as nitrogen, from their surroundings. After uptake, plants incorporate some of these nutrients into their tissues and feed the other fraction to the life in the soil, in the form of sugar and nutrient-rich compounds called root exudates. As such, if we are working with a marginal soil, we can plant hardy plants that grow rapidly, produce an abundance of nutrient-rich foliage, and can thrive when the soil is in marginal condition. These are are our pioneer plants. Pioneer plants are found in every single ecosystem with plants. They have the role of repairing the soil and paving the way for higher forms of plant life. By understanding the various roles and functions that pioneer plants play in the process of ecological succession, 
that is the regeneration of ecosystems, we can identify and grow plants that are able to perform similar functions in a vegetable gardening situation. In fact, many of the plants that we actually use for this are pioneer plants themselves in their own native habitats. All have adapted to these environments by developing mechanisms to sequester nutrients, such as this sweet clover here, which fixes nitrogen directly from the atmosphere, and improving the texture of the soil, such as flax here, which develops a long taproot to break compaction. Still others have a strong affinity for beneficial endosymbionts, or microorganisms that partner with plants to help them acquire nutrients, such as this tithonia here, which forms strong associations with mycorrhizal fungi. Others, such as this comfrey here, develop deep, vigorous root systems to begin mining nutrients from further down in the soil profile. When we establish these plants in a mixed annual planting, we call it a cover crop. When we utilize a perennial plant or tree to perform soil remediation and produce biomass over longer time scales, we call it a biomass plant or support species. What you're doing in both cases is growing large amounts of living biomass that can be utilized as food for your soil. The nutrients in whatever living biomass that you harvest and apply to your soil will be made available to other plants as it decomposes. A diverse cover crop should be the first planting in any regenerative garden system. And by diverse, I mean a dozen or more different species of legumes, grasses, broadleaf plants, brassicas, and insectary plants which serve the function of helping to establish and maintain a healthy population of beneficial insects in your garden. The support species I have been using include comfrey, tithonia, pigeon pea, moringa, yarrow, and sunchokes, or Jerusalem artichokes. Check the link in the description to this review paper published in the journal Agroforestry Systems describing the benefits of Tithonia diversifolia as a support species. There are numerous options for every climate. Support species have been utilized in traditional agroforestry systems by indigenous people from around the world for thousands of years. If you're just getting into support species, I highly recommend exploring plants native to your area and consulting with a local indigenous farmer or land steward about best practices. Tip number three is stop planting monocultures and start planting polycultures. You see, polycultures really pick two pea pods with one palm. On one hand, polycultures support soil health much better than monocultures do, as described in this paper published in the Journal of Agricultural Letters. On the other hand, increasing crop diversity can make your local ecosystem in your garden or farm less favorable to pests, as outlined in this review published in Cambridge University Press. Both are linked in the description. Polyculture design is a complex, multifaceted subject that is far too extensive to cover in detail in this video. I would say that the basic idea is this. Essentially, you want to design consortiums of multiple plant varieties that assume complementary roles and functions. Whether it's a legume fixing nitrogen for other plants, a grassy plant stimulating soil biology, or a flowering insectary plant that is providing habitat for beneficial insects. A well-designed polyculture also contains a mix of plants that stack in both space and time, so that no two variety of plants in the polyculture occupy the same niche on the surface, space in the rooting zone, and even harvest period. Diverse polycultures are also able to utilize resources in the soil much more efficiently, and overall do a better job at providing a healthy ecosystem, both for your crops and for local wildlife. A common example of a polyculture system is the Three Sisters Garden of corn, beans, and squash. This polyculture also oftentimes contains flowering plants such as marigolds as well as other vegetables, depending on the region it is being practiced in and by what culture. This polyculture system has been utilized by many indigenous groups throughout the Americas for thousands of years. Polycultures can be grown both in traditional rows or blocks or scattered in a chaos garden mix. A good polyculture won't just grow food. It will produce biomass, feed the soil, and manage the local insect population to favor the beneficials. Next comes tip number four. Tap into the power of the soil food web beneath our feet. Everything I've spoken of previously has the effect of supporting the soil food web. Yet, I feel this bit needs a little more explaining. Healthy soil is the ultimate goal of the regenerative gardener. So I think it's fitting to talk about how healthy soil can save you time and resources while doing good for our home planet Earth. The USDA Soil Biology Primer gives a great overview of all the life forms you can find in healthy soil and how they interact with plants. In a nutshell, plants and soil work together as a single living system called a hollow it's kind of like a living thing made out of living things. It's pretty meta. This holobiont is able to capture and store nutrients and energy from its environment, recycle its waste products, and reproduce itself. 
Plants and the soil food web are the engines that drive the whole system, not the latest and greatest formulation of miracle magic plant drugs or that bottle of ultra grow vitamin Z that you keep getting those annoying ads for. Unless you are working in extremely poor soil or using a low quality pre-made potting mix that won't even work for as long as the new iPhone model, all of the nutrients that your plants need to grow should already be in the earth or in the air all around you. All our plants need is a healthy soil food web to unlock those nutrients. But Mr. Solar Punk Farmer, how the heck can you cultivate a healthy soil food web? That sounds really hard. And something I may have to pay good money on a certification course to learn how to do. Fortunately, encouraging life in the soil is certainly not something you need to drop a couple G's on a course for. The good thing about nature's technology is that it's free. Here's how to get started. Firstly, I would highly recommend checking out the five soil health principles as outlined by the Natural Resources Conservation Service at the United States Department of Agriculture. You can find more information by following the link in the description. All right, so if you're starting completely from scratch like me, I would highly recommend incorporating in or applying some organic matter to your soil. As I've shown you, you can do this completely for free and it'll greatly speed up the process of soil building. Then you're going to need to prepare and introduce an inoculum or a diverse cross-section of our soil food web. This is something you can buy in the form of microbe formulations or something you can make yourself using techniques such as IMO or JMS Jadam. I applied JMS Jadam to my garden, which is made from healthy leaf mold soil from a forest, potatoes, sea salt, and water. Check out the video on my IGTV if you want to watch me make that. You can also apply a compost tea or extract as a soil drench. In general, liquid inoculants are highly effective at getting the pore spaces in your soil saturated with all kinds of little helpers. Another thing that works well is to amend with a small amount of high quality compost or worm castings. Then you need to get living roots in your soil in order to propagate and maintain the biology you just established. You can start with vegetables in this initial phase, but at this point, you may find that you do need to apply some fertilizer after all. If you really want to grow out that biology and sequester tons of nutrients into your garden, go with the diverse cover crops every time. So in a nutshell, cultivate the life in your soil, practice no-dig gardening, and do not drink the big ag Kool-Aid. At the end of the day, healthy soil means healthy plants that require less fertilizer and less pest control to stay healthy. And last but certainly not least, tip number five. Turn your kitchen scraps into worm castings. Look at that. As I'm sure you can see now, the previous tips were leading up to the idea of producing your own inputs. However, this tip is for those of you who are container gardeners. Those of you who do not have the space to grow your own fertility and plant out larger polyculture systems. I may be lucky enough to have access to a small amount of land, but not all of us do. Thank you, late stage capitalism. Very cool. The unfortunate truth about container gardens is running them without fertilizer is extremely difficult, if not impossible. Container gardens are semi-closed systems that leach nutrients and lack the geological mechanisms to replace them. Therefore, nutrients must be added back via fertilization one way or another. An extremely low cost and absolutely fantastic way to produce fertilizer is to recycle your kitchen scraps into a source of fertility using vermicomposting. No garden is complete without a worm farm, but many gardeners do not realize that it's actually possible to scale down a worm farm and operate it indoors. Not only can you build a worm farm that is small enough to fit under a kitchen sink, a properly managed worm farm is super low maintenance and completely odorless. My system right here barely gets any attention at all. All I really do is feed the worms once every week or so and harvest castings every now and then. Finished worm castings do indeed contain a substantial amount of nutrients. I know working with worm poop sounds gross, but it's a lot less gross than working with putrefied fish guts. Oh. Plus, it's a fantastic way to reduce your household's food waste footprint while producing your own fertility, whether you garden in the ground like me or have a beautiful and bountiful container patio garden. Well, there you have it. Five tips to help you travel down the path of truly sustainable gardening. All we gotta do is use our human ingenuity to understand and work with the processes of creating life on this planet. And that is truly solar punk. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you do, please feed me likes, comments, and subscriptions, and click the bell icon down below so that you can be notified when I post future videos. Also, be sure to check out my Instagram to see what's going down on a day-to-day -day basis in my beautiful solar punk paradise. Anyways, thank you for tuning in and catch you outside, cultivating resilience.